Well, it's so shocking, or maybe not shocking, but maybe disturbing about this article. This is the Wall Street Journal article republished in MSN. But here is a uh, retired General Ben Hodges, who was <laughs> once the U.S. Army in your view, probably very familiar with him, Scott. He said, we probably made some bad assumption because over the last 20 years, we were launching precision weapons against people that could not do anything about it. Exactly what you said. You know, I always say. It's not just us saying this. It's not just Scott Ritter saying this. It's 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 literally the horse's mouth. Now we are doing it against a peer opponent, and Russia and China do have these capabilities. Basically, everything that you outline. But what's so sh- striking about that is no one no one's listening. Stephen, you know, it, it, Stephen Walt, the realist that, um, who's co-authored a book with uh, John Mearsheimer about the Israel lobby, was talking about just all of these we don't think about these disadvantages that NATO has over time that may lead to its demise. But one of the things that it does has have is this just, uh, it has the, it's been around for so long and it's had this free terrain for so long to be dominant for so long that while we can't predict its collapse anytime soon, it, it, it's trending in that direction, but it feels like this is that kind of like, it's like this entrenched what it's like it's so entrenched just we're gonna just keep on doing what we've been doing you know it 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 doesn't it as you said it doesn't really matter to them it's just they just keep staying the course success no success and you know ukrainians pay for it of course the world pays for it. the world economy everyone pays for it um scott uh, your reaction well you know when the Cold War ended, the United States, um, you know, we, we, I remember it very well, we were searching for the peace dividend. And so, you know, look, we've never been perfect. But I have to tell you, the military of the 1980s was as close to perfection as you're going to get. Um, because we existed for one reason and one reason only, and that was to literally fight two and a half wars at the same time and win. Um, and we trained so very hard to do this. We, uh, we had good equipment. We had good leaders. We had good quality troops. We had gotten over the malaise of Vietnam. We had volunteers that were coming in. And, um, you know, we had this very professional military, but it was expensive as hell it, to, to keep this military the size that we had. Because, again, fighting two and a half wars requires a lot of troops and a lot of equipment. We had prepositioned equipment. This is what enabled us to do Desert Storm. Uh, so that the Marine 7th Amphibious Brigade, or became the uh, Marine 7th Marine Expeditionary Brigade, um, could just get on airplanes, fly to the Middle East, and sh- shipping containing their equipment uh, would get to the port, offload. They could marry up that equipment and go on. You didn't have to load up all the equipment on a ship and have that ship sail out with the Marines on board like you did in World War II or in Korea. We had pre- maritime prepositioning ships. Um, we could, we could marry up. The army did the same thing. Um, you know, we were ready for this conflict. And then we said, well, the cold war is over. We don't need to fight two and a half wars anymore. Um, and so we broke it down for a while. We were there doing one and a half wars. And then they said, you know, one war. And then they said, well, just, uh, we're just going to be ready to respond to little, crises. We're not really prepared to fight a war. If we need to fight a war, uh, well, we don't know who we're going to fight against because we've got great relations with the Chinese. Uh, you know, we're waiting for them to turn over to capitalism. Uh, the Soviet Union's gone. Russia's weak. And there's not going to be a major war in Europe. We're just going to focus on making these expeditionary brigades that we could send around. Oh, gosh, 9-11 came. Let's send our troops over to Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, you know, but we're going to keep that brigade structure because we really don't know what we're doing. And, um, and, and, the, and the system just became broke, um, fundamentally broke. We don't know how to fight a modern war. But this has never been about fighting a modern war. Since the end of the Cold War, it's been about institutionalizing war profiteering. Uh, it's stopped being about giving the troops that which they need to accomplish the mission. And it became, how do we posture in the most expensive way? We became addicted to technology. We, As we shrunk our military and shrunk the capacity to deploy uh, meaningful numbers of troops, we offset that with technology. We have 
you know, artillery systems that can fire quicker and more accurately. We can, you know, we don't need all these troops because we can cover it with aircraft. I mean, we became addicted to air power in Afghanistan and Iraq because there was no air defense. There was no hostilities. There was not, you know, no hostile aircraft. We could just control the skies and we became spoiled, spoiled by the immediate availability of aircraft. Um, and, and it just changed everything we did. Our defense industry uh, became about building the most expensive weapon system down the road without really thinking it through about who we wanted to fight. We claimed we needed just to be better than everybody. And so that's how we got F-22s. That's how we got F-35s, two really crappy systems. Scott, they're not crap. They're really good. They're not really good. Difficult to maintain. Why do you think we stopped producing the F-22? <laughs> because it's not very good. And the F-35, Congress right now is reviewing it. It's not very good either. Um, they're just not good airplanes. The, that B-21 bomber we're building, it's not very good either. That Sentinel uh, ground launch uh, ballistic missile, we're building, it, it's really not any good. We don't build anything that's good anymore. It's very expensive. There's a lot of technology involved, but it's designed simply to put money in the pockets of the defense industry um, that then feeds that money back into the political system so that both the representatives who allocate the money and the people who receive the money are very happy. That's what the American defense industry has become. It's a cycle of corruption, so to speak. But it's not about giving our war fighters the best equipment possible. It's the exact opposite. And now we have a system right now where we can't fight a war. Literally, we can't fight a war. I, not a modern war. I know there's a lot of people out there who take umbrage at that. But, you know, what do we have? Uh, what do we got in Europe? How many troops do we have? Can those troops, you know, do the sustain? Back in the Cold War, when you know, I, I, when I lived in Germany, uh, you know, they ran exercises called Reforger. And I remember uh, Reforger '77, the year that I arrived. Uh, Reforger '78, '79. Um, basically, you know, we would fly in. We had the ability to fly in three hundred thousand troops in ten days. Three hundred thousand troops. In addition to the 250,000 troops we already had in Germany, 300,000 troops who would fall in on their pre-positioned equipment. So we had entire corps worth of equipment there, core, not division, not brigade, not battalion, corps, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of troops fly in, marry up with their equipment. Now, this equipment isn't just there. It's got to have ammunition ammunition ready to fight now and sustain that fight. So we had massive ammunition dumps full of ammo ready for the war. Those tanks need gas. They need petrol. Where is that? We have huge fuel dumps already. The fuel purchased ready earmarked for the war. We have aircraft in place with the fuel, with the bombs, with the missiles, everything right there leaning forward to go to war. We were ready. Um, today, we got nothing. They, they put a brigade in Poland. In, in one little place. You don't think the Russians can put some misconders in there and just take that out that quick? Of course they can. Um, we've got one port we land in, Hamburg. That too is going to be gone. Then where do we land? What kind of infrastructure does Europe have? Europe's not prepared for this anymore. Europe used to do nothing but prepare for this kind of fighting. Every part of Europe was prepared for it. Today, no, none of Europe's prepared for it. They don't think about it, and they can't afford to become prepared for it. This is one of the frustrating things for NATO right now because they keep talking to the need to expand. But the reality is they're looking at going, we can't afford it. We can't afford to do this expansion because it's not just about, you know, building more tanks, building more. It's from top to bottom reconditioning Europe to be ready for large scale ground combat in Europe. Europe's not ready for it. Their infrastructure is not ready for it. <laughs> Nothing. They're politically not ready for it. The mindset's not ready for it. The Russians are. The Russians have been prepared for this for some time now. Since 2008, Russia got a wake-up call when they fought that short little war against Georgia. Yes, Russia won, but it wasn't pretty. Um, the Georgian infantry <laughs> was trained by the Marines. And um, the Russians were saying, these guys, small unit tactics are pretty damn good. I mean, they're moving, they're shooting, they're communicating, they're, they're doing stuff. You know, there's just not enough of them. So we're able to blow the hell out of them with artillery moving with tanks and, and all that. But they're really good. They communicate better than we do. They coordinate better than we do. We need to do this better. So in 2008, Russia started 
reworking it. We saw how improved they were in 2014 when the Russian military moved on Crimea, but even then the Russians had to work on it and they've been working on it ever since. The Russian military that started in 2022, in February 2022, still had a lot of problems. The Russian army today is the most combat tested military force on the planet. This is a military that's literally built for war from top to bottom. Every aspect of this military, all those fat ass officers that get developed in peacetime um, who, you know, don't do anything because they don't need to do anything. They just have to look good. Uh, they fake it to make it. Next thing you know, boom, they're a general. They're in a desk. They're geniuses, brilliant, running money and all that stuff. Then the war comes. And now they have to go out there and command. They have no idea how to do it. And they're out there and all those officers are gone. They're finished. The only officers in place today are guys that have proved themselves in combat. That's it. It's the crucible of excellence. And the Russian officers today, they may not be able to quote, you know, you know, the the the, the philosophers. They may not be the you know academic scholars of the these are guys that can sit down in the mud and plan a battle and execute the battle. And Russian officers are a little bit different, especially at the general level, than ours. Our general officers like to hang back in the rear with the phones on. Russian officers are like, what the hell's going on up front? We got to get me up to the front. They're out there in the front. Go, 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 move, move, move. Get out there. Bam, they're dead. There goes, oh, they killed a Russian general. The Russians suck. No, it's because their generals are out front leading. That's the way, that's what, that's called leadership. And um, the Russian military is full of battle tested. These guys, I mean, I, you know, that medal they put on the chest of people, that, that little star, the, the, the hero of Russia, look how many guys have it. And they don't get it. They don't give them away. You get it by doing some really kick-ass stuff. And then you take a look. You know, there was a time, you, you could tell, you know, when during the global war on terror, when special forces units were deploying often, um, you take a look at the chest of some of these guys and you're sitting there going, they have multiple silver stars, multiple bronze stars, multiple purple hearts. And you're going, Jesus, that guy's been around the block. Well, you're looking at these Russians and they got, you know, they got the gold star, but then they got the orders of valor, the orders of courage. And you're just sitting there going, how much goddamn, excuse my language, but how much fighting did these mother, did these guys do? Oh, they've been doing it. Yeah, that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, all they've been doing for the last two and a half years is fighting in the most intensive, high-intensity ground combat in modern history, fighting and surviving and winning. Um, and that's the totality of There are no weak-ass Russian officers anymore. You go to the Russian military academy now, and there's not the, you know, the hangar queens that have avoided doing anything real out there, just getting their academic punch, kick, pick, ticket punch so they can go serve the Kremlin and, uh, and get fat and happy. Those guys are gone. They've been purged. The guys that are in there right now are rock hard officers who are focused solely on combat tasks, how to make our military more lethal on the battlefield. If you're not on the battlefield, then you're taking the lessons from the battlefield back to academia, rewriting doctrine so that you can train people to be more efficient. This is a lean, mean killing machine. And um, the West just can't can't match it right now because we don't have that mindset. We're not in the mindset of. This is existential. Uh, they're still running everything as normal uh, in, in the West. You go to West Point. They are so DEI crazy right now. It's, it's, it's crazy. I don't mean to, I'm not, I, I didn't run to go there, but, you know, we forgot what it's like to be killers because, again, if you're in the military, you only have one job. I don't mean to be too crude, but it's to kill people. That's it. You exist to either kill them yourselves or help other people be ready to kill them facilitate death. If you're not facilitating the death of the enemy, then why are you in the military? Get the hell out. We're worried about the wrong things. The Russians are producing equipment that is designed to help their soldiers defeat the enemy that quick. In and out. They are they are turning around problem sets. You know, as they gather intelligence, they take it up to defense industry and they are turning that around and getting a weapon back that answers a problem within months. It takes us years to get defense industry to do something, and then only if we prime them with enough dollars, uh, because it's not about helping the shooter. It's about helping the politician. It's about jobs. It's about me. You remember the 
66 billion we wanted to send or the 90 billion 66 of which was ukrainian that was held up remember the number one selling point how it was sold it's all about jobs man why are you guys opposing this 48 billion of this isn't even going to ukraine it's coming right back into us to make jobs we're going to build weapons for us jobs 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 god we're doing the wrong thing we should be right now if we're serious about this we should be getting a military in peacetime that's ready to operate day one in wartime, which means we have to get hard, we have to get focused, we have to train, and we have to get our defense industry in gear. None of that's happening because there's no necessity for it. And that tells you something. All this political talk about Russia being a threat, the politicians know that it's BS. Because if Russia was really a threat, then we would be leaning forward hard. But we're not because we know Russia is not a threat. We know that Russia is not going to go into Poland. We know Russia is not going to go into the Baltics. We're making all this stuff up so that we can justify sending more money to Ukraine, which we're willing to sacrifice uh, so that we can have jobs in America that are based upon producing weapons that uh, are there to service conflicts abroad that we create. I just told you how America operates in the world today. We create conflicts abroad. They generate a need for military systems that we produce, we provide, and we put money in the pockets of the defense industry and the American politicians. That's the sickest justification for the existence of a nation I can possibly imagine. But that's America in a nutshell today. I wish it wasn't. I'm not proud of it. I'd love to change it. But um, that's the reality. We need war for our economy to work. Hmm. Yes, indeed. War... A lot, whole lot of distractions, indeed, even the issues that you brought up in terms of what Russia is focused on versus uh, what the United States is focused on. Important issues at a lot of different levels. But then it's, again, as you said, Scott, uh, the United States is talking about war, fighting a threat. And yet at the same time, uh, uh, they are promoting these wars to people. I mean, a lot of it is to... Um, uh, get uh, especially American liberals on board with war, promoting them as well. You know, if if there's diversity in it, if there's transgender rights in it, then that makes war okay, and that makes this suicidal mission against Russia, which will, um, as you said a lot, Scott, won't end with a shooting war. It'll likely end in a nuclear war uh, because of all of the things that you just uh, mentioned here on this program so far. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Hai Fong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.